Hello, and welcome to Sobercast, where we provide AA speaker meetings and workshops in podcast format. We're an ad-free podcast, and if you enjoy listening, please help us be self-supporting by visiting Sobercast.com, look for the donate link, and drop a dollar or two into our virtual basket. We hope you enjoy the podcast. Have a great day. Hi, my name is Charlie. I'm an alcoholic. And I want to thank Bob for inviting me here, and uh, it's good to see so many friends, and even with masks on. If you know somebody really well, you know you know someone well, and when you recognize them with their mask on, then, then you know you're, you're fine. And uh, Bob, I, I love Bob. I do anything Bob asked me to do. He's a bright spot in my life, and I really appreciate uh, being invited, so thank you. And um, anyway, uh, I'm not used to being around live alcoholics, you know, like really breathing alcoholics. It's really strange. Welcome. Uh, George and Dexter, I'm glad you're here, and I uh, hope you find something here that, that keeps you here. Uh, I'm sober since the 11th of June of 1981. I have a sponsor named Bob R. who lives up in Oxnard, California. He is uh, 55 years sober and still active, has been all his sobriety. And um, my life has been... Uh, my life is nothing without the influences of sober people and the influences that they've had on it. And I've met a lot of people in those years, and every one of them has had some impact in my life and has helped me stay on the on the path one way or another. Either through good example or bad example, it doesn't really matter right right now. It's just uh, people's examples have helped. And I, you know, um, I love alcohol. Alcohol gave me the satisfaction of a job well done without having to do a damn thing. I just love the sensation. And and my uh, <clears throat> I can probably summarize my whole drinking career in a story about a year before I got sober and had this happen. I um that's not a dramatic story, so there's not like a big payoff at the end. But um I was working, I was trying I wanted to be a writer. So first I got a job working in a bookstore. Which is like, it's like, you know, it's like wanting to be a, a, a mechanic and getting a job in a mechanic bookstore. You know, you're just selling books about mechanics, but you're not really doing anything. And so I worked there for a long time, and I got a chance to go back to school. And so I went back to school to be, as a journalism major, and I got, uh, I had a pretty good time doing that. And uh, by my, the time I was ready, to, about six months before I graduated, we got a chance to have to be interns at local newspapers, and, and I got sent down to the Los Angeles Times, and so I was working on, as an intern down there, and it was it was tough because I'd go down there and I knew, just like I felt in the general public, I didn't fit in. I just did not fit in with these people. I don't. They know so much more than I do. They're so much smarter than I am, uh, and they put me to work right away doing stuff. So. I thought I was going to be making coffee for editors, you know, that kind of stuff. Instead, they just sent me out to do stories, and I was shocked, you know, and terrified. But I did them. And the minute I was finished that day, I was there three day, two or three days a week. Uh, the minute I finished that day, I would go off, and uh, I was staying in my mother-in-law's house. She lived out in Irvine. I was in the Orange County edition. And I would go to my mother-in-law's house, and I would drink. I would drink until I'd pass out. You know, just and the next morning I'd wake up with a hangover and go back in there and try to do it again and, and would do it. And and um, I don't know how I did it, but when I finally graduated from college with a, with my bachelor's degree, I got a call about two months later that the editor of the LA Times said that the Milwaukee Journal had called and wanted a stringer. That's a person that they want to cover a story, like if you wanted a story covered on the other side of the country, rather than send one of your own reporters out there with all that expense, you'd hire a local reporter to file the story back with you. So they hired, the the, uh, editor recommended me, which surprised me. So... I said, what's the assignment? He said, well, you're going you're gonna to cover the United Auto Workers Convention in Anaheim. And it's a four-day thing, and you're going to do that, and then we'll, they'll pay you $350. And I said, wow, okay, I'll do that. Because slogging books off of trucks wasn't paying that well. And um, so I went and I, covered, I did my first day, and I covered my stories, and I got my interviews. And, and then I went home and, and uh, 
went to my mother-in-law's house, like I said, I was in her office, I was sleeping in there and staying in there, and I had to file my story by 5 o'clock in the morning in Milwaukee, I had to call it into the, this is back in 1980, right, so it's a long time ago, so I had to call it in, and I, I had a bottle of bourbon, and I, start, I had a couple of drinks, and I thought, it's 6.30 at night, nope. I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to watch a little TV, and then I'll get my story done. I'll start at 7, get the story done by 9, have a perfectly calm evening, get up tomorrow morning, and really go get up. And so I'm drinking and watching television, and then I, I realize it's, it's 10 after 7 now. And I thought, no one starts work at 10 after 7. You know, I'm going to go, I'll wait till 7.30, and then I'll start. Serious, it's 7.30. And again, it's like, I get to 7.30 and think, 8 o'clock. I'm going to start at 8 o'clock, and, and I'm still drinking this whole time. And I'm feeling great. And I've got all the confidence I need to do it at 8 o'clock. I'm sure I'll get it done. 8 o'clock to 10, it's just an extra hour. I had it all set up. 8.15, I thought, boy, I... Maybe I should start. Well, you know how you know how it goes. I don't have to tell alcoholics how that goes. Uh, by about one o'clock in the morning, I had I couldn't write anything. I was panicking. I mean, panicking, get, trying to breathe and trying to get things written. I'd thrown everything out, and finally, by the time uh, five o'clock in the morning came around, when I had to call with my story, I called them and I had my notebook open and I just dictated a story off the top my head to them because I couldn't write it and they said thank you and I got off at about 6 6.30 and then I had to go back in and work again so now I gotta go back and cover that convention the next day now I haven't had any sleep I was drunk the night before so I get there cover my get my interviews going cover my interviews um, same thing happens you know I'm, I'm hanging out with all the communist writers because they're the most fun those regular press <laughs> regular press is kind of boring but the guys from the people's worker are just you know anyway uh, I hung with them and everybody got drunk after the after work and I went home back to my mother-in-law's house and knew I had to file my story but you know the same thing happened. I just wanted to watch TV till 8 o'clock, and it's 8.15, and you can't start writing at 8.15, so I work at 9, and then 9.05, and 9.05, I'll we'll go to 9.30, you know, and it's just that, it's like, a, it's like a gambling thing. Let's let it roll. Let's just keep letting it roll, and then see what happens. Well, we know what's going to happen. I knew what was going to happen, and again, the same thing happened. The next morning I got up, I called in my story and dictated it to him off the top of my head. You know, and the and the guy, the reporter on the other line, dutifully wrote it all down for their their afternoon edition, and I was just a wreck. Well, I got a little sleep that afternoon. And I went back the following day, and the same thing happened. Only this time, I had I made a vow. I am not going to do this again. I am not going to fall into this trap again of getting started with this nonsense. So I will not do it. And I put my own foot down, which is really dangerous for an alcoholic to put his own foot down on his own behavior. And um, I went in and got my stories. And then they said, you know, there's a, there's a reception, because the United Auto Workers Convention was over that day. And there's a reception at the end of the day at the Disneyland Hotel on about the 30th floor, whatever the tallest floor was there. Uh, you know, they gave me their room number, and so the communists and I all sacked it over there, you know, to the uh, hotel, and we walked in there, and, you know, I'm not going to, I'm not drinking. This, I'm just going here, too, so I can say I've been here. I walk in, and the first thing the host said is, uh, anybody drink Jack Daniels? And I thought, you know, yeah, I do. And, and, and is Jack Daniels all right with you? I said, yeah. And, and, the, and the communists all wanted to drink. So I just went along with it. And pretty soon, it was in about, it must have been about an hour and a half, I remember coming out of a blackout on the balcony of the hotel room with the ambassador, the U.S. ambassador to China, who had been a UAW a president in the past, Leonard Woodcock, you can look him up. He was standing out there, and I was showing him how I could lean back 
over the edge of the balcony with my feet locked under the rail and for how far back I could lean, which I'm sure he remembered to his grave, um, that moment at that place. But it just never got any better, and I went home, and then after about two weeks, I got a check in the mail for, they were going to pay me $300, but they paid me, or $350, but they paid me $300. And I was angry at first, and then I realized... I didn't deserve $350. If they paid me $100, that would have been too much. And I'm never going to, I don't ever want to do this again. And that's pretty much a summation of my whole life up to that point. I was 29 years old at the time, and I didn't get sober till the next year. And I was sick and physically tired. I didn't want to be an alcoholic. I had decent parents. My father was a, a Marine Corps vet. He was an eight-year Marine and uh, had been in World War II and had been in the China Marines in the 30s. And, and my mother was a good woman who, who was a good housewife and, and mom. And um, I was brought up in a good community with good teachers and good values that were transmitted to me. And I never had anything thrown in my path that you could call setback. Like, I know a lot of alcoholics, and I know a lot of regular people too, but a lot of people have a lot of stuff thrown in their path that's really unfair and unjust and cruel. And, and yet you see them prevail over it. And I, in turn, had a lot of breaks. And I never took one of those breaks and took advantage of it to become anything. I just pretty much thought, okay, I got to, that was good. Now that's over with and moved on. And um, I remember at the end of that internship at the LA Times, I was in the car and they took me out to lunch because that's what they do. There were other reporters carpool and they take the, the intern out, you know, and thank him for being there. We went and had lunch and we're driving back and we're driving through Costa Mesa and at the time there were lots of lots of strawberry fields out there. And there were people picking strawberries out there and I was looking at them as we were driving by and I said to the people in the car, Did you ever just want a job like that where you could just be out in the field picking strawberries and and I said, and just have nobody bother you? And everybody in the car went, No you know, and it was just a jolt because I thought maybe they would have, you know, I could have gotten them to agree with me. So uh, it was it was an eye opener, but I never I never spoke about what I was feeling out loud again. You know, you don't ever articulate what you're feeling as an alcoholic while you're a practicing alcoholic. You just tuck it away, and you stick it down in there, and you just let it let it get down in there and let it get infected and let it get sore, and let it start to boil away at the rest of your guts until you just can't stand it anymore. And then just drink some more to try to put that fire out, and it never goes out. It never goes out. And um, a year later, I wound up, um, nothing dramatic, I wound up peeing blood, which I had done before, so that was not a big deal. I'd had, I'd had a pancreas attack before. That was no big deal. I'd had alcohol poisoning. That wasn't bad enough. But it was just a regular day, and I went to a meditation retreat that my therapist was throwing, which, you know, I went there, I went there and was going to kill myself, which is certainly, uh, uh, you know, save your receipt if you decide to do that. But um, I went there, and I didn't, I didn't want to, I just decided I didn't want to live anymore. And I was going to do it, but I didn't have whatever whatever it takes to kill yourself, whether it's courage or or it's cowardice. I didn't have it, and I just sat out in this uh, meditation grounds and I just cried like a baby. And um, at the depth of my despair, I felt loved from uh, through my whole being. I felt loved. I don't know how that happened. And I, I realize now it's um, it was the presence of a power that's bigger than I, am, really, which I'd never encountered before in my life. There was never a bigger, there was never a power bigger than I am. I am the captain of my own destiny. You probably heard that from your parents too. You know, you make your own life for yourself, and I believe that. You know, you you. You don't air your dirty linen in public. That's what I was told. You don't tell people how you're weak. You know, especially for men. I don't know about women, but I know for men for sure, you never let other men see where you're weak. Ever show that. Because they will take it and run with it. And you'll never you'll never rise to any level uh, of any kind of stature with men if you show your weakness. 
And I knew all that, and I knew I was weak, and I knew I had all these things going on. And the one thing I also knew on top of everything else was that what made me different, and I didn't know I was different at this time, I thought it worked this way for everybody, but an ounce of alcohol makes me feel better about my life. And that is what makes me an alcoholic, because it doesn't, it doesn't work that way for 90% of the human race, statistically. It's 10% of us have alcoholism. Other people can, they're, at least Bob and I saw them tonight. The bar was busy, busy, busy over at Brent's, and people were having a good time. No one was causing any trouble. But 90, but if there were 100 people in that bar, 10 of them had a problem with alcohol, statistically speaking. And, uh, but I, I happen to be one of them. I can't, for some reason, alcohol has a, It has a contradictory effect on me. It makes me feel so much better about my life when I drink it. It makes me feel like I have hope for a change. It makes me feel like people are okay. It makes me feel like I'm not afraid. It makes me feel like I'm better looking than I am. You know, like, ladies, my eyes are up here, good looking. And um, I just felt, dude, when I drink, I just feel like a, like a man when I drink. And you would think... And that term, you would think, is the great tripwire of, of alcoholism. Because you, you'd think, logically speaking, and kaboom. But um, you would think that if you found a substance where you could drink an ounce of it, and it would make you feel like a human being, even with everybody else, if not above everybody else, you know? There's no mistake that alcoholics are, have been described as people who are, you know, laying in the gutter looking down on other people. Yeah, that's true. A friend of mine said, I'm a, I'm a piece of shit that the world revolves around. And that's true. That's a contradictory feeling that we are comfortable with. And when I drink, though, that goes, I feel better. I feel hopeful. I feel joy. I feel connection. And I didn't realize at the time that that's all, a, it's an illusion. It's just an illusion. I, I've never come out of a blackout and found the bills paid, you know. And then you come up, you get up. I get up off the ground after sleeping under a dish towel because it was there, you know. And uh, I couldn't get up in bed, so I had a dish towel over my shoulder. I never got up and go, "Whoa, the bills are all paid." Never has happened, you know. I've gone uh, and I started drinking because I didn't have enough money to pay the bills. And I, when I started drinking, I felt so much better that I was going to make so much money this year. You know, but then when I came out of the blackout, the stuff was still there. My, I've never been dragged out of the living room by a wife, and there have been a couple, uh, dragged by, you know, one arm into the bedroom because I was left asleep in the kitchen and felt to myself, you know, this could work. This really could. I, I just sense with a little, a little extra output on her part things could work out. It's never happened. It's always an illusion. I always feel better, though, when, when I'm in a bad relationship with somebody that a few shots of alcohol, and I feel like I like them more. You know? And nothing has changed. Nothing has changed, except the effect alcohol has on me. And, um, and so I got brought to alcohol. I went to Alcoholics Anonymous because I had to bring somebody here. It was a Sunday night. There was a woman that got out of a detox in uh, in Orange County, and she asked if she could have a ride. She was my sister-in-law. She said, can, can I get a ride to an AA meeting? Because they told us in the detox that uh, the AA people said, try to get to a meeting after you get out so that you don't, you're not just hanging there untethered when you get out of the, out of the detox. So I went and picked her up. I'm going to be the hero because I quit drinking that week. After that moment in the meditation retreat, I didn't drink after that. And so I go to pick her up, and we drive for 20 minutes to the to the uh, meeting place, and she 12 stepped me in the 20 minutes it took to get there. And she had 22 days of sobriety. So if you don't have, feel like you have a lot of sobriety, like you're counting days and that, trust me, you've got something to share with somebody who's got less time than you do. If you've got three days, you've got a lot to tell somebody with one day on how to stay sober, way more than I do. Because my... Uh, they're not gonna. They're gonna look at me like you. You don't even remember what alcohol 
feels like. Well, wrong there. Uh, I can conjure up the taste and effect of alcohol in my head right this moment if I wanted to, but I won't. Uh, but I, um, I got to the meeting place with her, and she didn't try to. She didn't even twelve step me like you try to proselytize somebody. She just told me what she, how much she learned from the people in this detox, you know, because there weren't many detoxes around in 1981. I mean, there, there were a few, but not many. Most of them were the, like the torture chambers, like, uh, uh, was that one? Raleigh Hills, you know, where they, they give you the medicine and then they make you drink. And, um, but she was, she was really alive and she looked better than she looked than I'd seen her in years. And she looked hopeful and, and healthy and that's what I noticed when she was talking. She just told me what she found when she was in there. She wasn't telling me anything. And I told her I'd quit drinking that week, you know, as I swatted at the imaginary gnats that are gathering in my peripheral vision and, the, and hearing sounds in the backseat that aren't there and having all that stuff that happens when you quit drinking where you're not, you're not sure. You know, it says that we're be, bewildered and befuddled when we come start, stop drinking. That's, those two words work for me. And uh, so we pull up in front of the meeting, and I said, what time do you want me to come pick you up? Because that signals I'm not going in. And she said, well, why don't you come in the meeting with me? And I said, because I'm not alcoholic. And you know, I batted away the imaginary gnats. And you know, she, she said, well, it does, it's okay if you're not alcoholic because, uh, whoops, this is, a, uh, this is an open meeting. And we welcome guests. They welcome guests there. And since you quit drinking this week, maybe you'll hear something that'll help you. And she was too new to know what to say like that. You know, she was too new. But she she said it to me, and I couldn't argue with it. I couldn't get my filters up. You know, to hear where she where she tried to get that. It was just logic to me. And I said, okay, I'll go. And I parked the car. And I went in, and boy, was I sorry I walked in the minute I walked in there because it was like a, you know, hyper, if you're just new from to AA from Zoom, uh, a lot of physical meetings are big, and there's lots of people in there, and it's like a, like a hyper-caffeinated dog park. There's a lot, of, a lot of activity going on, a lot, but nothing really happening. It's just a lot of stuff, people talking, and they're really talking, and they're into it, and they're shaking hands, and they're trying to find new people to cling on to. They go, come here, let me show you something. And, um, and I, was, I was terrified. Like, I was always terrified of people. I never liked people, especially in numbers. And there they were. You know, they're all happy for some stupid reason. And I, I stood in the back of the room. I had a, a Sherlock Holmes hat that I was wearing at the time. I had long hair, and I, I was rocking on my heels, and I had sunglasses on because you know how it gets at night. And um, there I was, just rocking on my heels, looking at everybody and wondering why these guys were coming up going, are you new? And I thought, no, I'm not new. I didn't have had a drink for four days. You know, I thought when you meant new, I was drunk when I came across the threshold, and that's not the case. I kind of got this wired, you know, I haven't had a drink in four days, you know, as, as the, as the gnats are becoming more oppressive. And, uh, so they gave me phone numbers and called me, you know, so I was definitely not going to do that. I'm not going to call you, please. And, um, I heard the speaker that night. I got a big book. Somebody forced a big book on me and, um, uh, and they're sneaky, too, because I only had three bucks. And I, they brought me to the literature lady who looked like something out of a horror novel. She, had, she was about six foot two. She wore a white starched baseball cap, that, I mean a uh, cowboy hat. that came down, and the brim went up like this. And she had white, platinum white hair, and she wore a platinum white chiffon Blouse with these big chiffon pants. It looked like she ran through a set of drapes when she was coming into the meeting. And she brayed when she talked. She had a really loud voice. And they said, to, uh, Debbie, who brought me there, said, Charlie needs a big book. Oh, you need a big book, Charlie? Oh, geez, please, just stop. I work in a bookstore. I don't need this. And, uh, and she uh, handed me the big book and she said, Those are, I said, How much is it? She said, $5. I thought, okay, well, look. I said, listen, I'll come back next week and get it. How's that? And she goes, you know what? Is it? Is it the second Tuesday of the month or the second Sunday of the month? Because on oh, 
it is the second Sunday of the month. They're two dollars tonight. Let me just say two dollars, and that book is yours. You can have it. And that other dollar, when the basket goes around, be sure to drop that in because nobody stays sober around here on somebody else's dime. You know, I thought, okay, you know, she she had my attention because she was taller than I was, and she was she knew what she was talking about. So when that basket went around, man, I had that dollar bill up. I didn't know where she was in the room. I wanted to make sure she could see it was going to the basket. You know, I watched it. I watched that thing drift down, you know, into the basket and uh, felt like she wasn't going to come after me. And um, and then I left that meeting that night. I heard the speaker. I enjoyed the speaker. I don't know why. I laughed at all the wrong places. Because uh, I thought, you know, because when you knew, when you come to AA, at least my experience, I, start, I thought, uh, yeah. I appreciate your being so nice, but you really don't understand what my problem is. You know, my problem is I need to quit drinking, and I need to learn how to stop drinking, or how to drink and how much toast to eat right before I go out, so that I'm not drinking on an empty or you know slightly burnt toast. Uh, all the techniques that people who have trouble that alcohol gives them trouble. How do you do, how do you get around all that? And then I get in here and the first thing I hear is abstinence. Now I know what abstinence is. I, it kind of was like, did I hear that properly? And uh, and then, you know, they start talking about their spiritual lives and their higher power and all this stuff. I'm in the seat, you know, I'm a, I'm a fallen Catholic. I'm just staring at them and thinking, this is not for me. Uh, I can't, I can't get in here. I, I want to hear something practical. And uh, and the speaker got up, and I remember this guy vividly because it made me laugh, and, and everybody else laughed, but for a different reason. He said he was in the army, and he had he was in a jeep, and he hit a tree in his jeep drunk, and it threw him through the windshield, and he hit the tree, and it broke his jaw, and so they wired his jaw shut, but his front tooth was broken. So he could take a straw and put it through the break in the front tooth, and he could drink that way. And he was drinking some bourbon one night, and one of his buddies said, you better not do that because I know how you drink, and you're going to get sick to your stomach, and your jaw is wired shut. And when you go to throw up, you're going to suffocate on your own vomit. And everybody in the room was like, and the AA meeting was, whoa. And he said, so from that moment on, I carried a pair of wire cutters in my backpack. <laughs> Everybody laughed like that, and I, my thought was that that's what I need to hear. That's exactly the kind of information they need to be giving to alcoholics, you know, is carry wire cutters. I'd have to have a whole tool belt with stuff that was going on in my life, but um, and my life wasn't even that bad. It was bad enough for me. Uh, everybody's here because the bottom was bad enough. You don't have to ever, ever apologize for whatever your bottom was. It could be the worst bottom in the world. I've heard some. I've heard some of the worst. The first woman I was friends with in AA, the first woman who was kind to me in sobriety, where she asked me my name and talked to me, she had married her own dad. And yeah, and uh, uh, you, you really can't. You can't talk that. God, you can you can talk about degradation, but you know when it comes down to just pure crowd appeal, marrying your own dad is, is quite. It makes everybody else go. I never did that. I, uh, I did a lot of stuff, but not that. And uh, she was kind to me, and uh, um, it was just uh, I I found myself uh, going to a meeting that I had. That was by where I worked. I worked in Santa Monica, and I was living in Orange County. So I thought if I drove home from Orange to Orange County from Santa Monica, it'd be past eight thirty, which is when most of the meetings began back then. I just can't get to the meeting, you know. Uh, so I kind of I go on Sunday nights because it was I probably I figured it was like religion, which it isn't. A is not a religion. It's not affiliated with any religion. But um, I thought they meet on Sundays. I'll go on Sunday. And so I went the next Sunday. I didn't drink the whole week. And I got there and, and heard uh, a guy named Chuck Chamberlain, who was the, the speaker of the night. And, and I didn't understand a word that guy said. And he, he was talking way over my head. And then they said, uh, the people I was sitting around said, uh, go, up and, go up and thank him for talking. I said, thank him for talking? I didn't understand what he said. 
And they said, it doesn't matter. Just go up and thank him. He gave up his Sunday night to be here. Just go talk. Go thank him. So, you know, okay. So I go up there. And, and Chuck was one of those guys. He was, at the time, he was sober about, I don't know, 25 or 30 years. And he um, he was as kind of the last person in line as he was the first person. And I got up to him, and, you know, I, he, I'm standing there and, and shaking his hand. And he, he says, how long are you sober, boy? I said, uh, about 20 days. And he goes, oh, God, I love you. And he threw his arms around my shoulder, and he kissed me on the cheek. And I think that's where I caught alcoholism. Because after that, I was, I was a completely different story. And uh, I, I came back the following week because Debbie, the woman who brought me there, was going to take a chip, which, oh, Lord, be still my beating heart. She, you get, she said, if you, if you stay sober 30 days, Charlie, you'll get a chip and a hug. And I thought, well... Who could, who could resist that? Uh, a chip and a hug. I mean, I'd be a lot more inclined to take a chip if somebody slip a five or a twenty on the back of it. Then I would really be excited and think you were sincere. Uh, but I went to see Debbie get her chip, and, and I'm glad I did because two days later she went out. At 32 days uh, of sobriety, she went out and drank again. It took her like nine years to get sober again, and I felt abandoned in AA. I felt like she just come and gone. I didn't have any friends and, and I heard a guy named Keith Carpenter speak at, my, at that Sunday night meeting and Keith uh, stayed an extra five minutes to talk to me. I was the last guy in line again because uh, that's just what I was. And um, Keith, if Keith, Keith had, a, had to drive from, from Tustin, California that night, which is a long ways down in Orange County, South Orange County, he had a good two hour drive to the west end of the valley, which is where he lived. And he stood there and talked to me for as long as he want, as long as I would talk to him, uh, even though he had that long trip to make. And I believe if he hadn't taken that five or ten minutes to talk to me, I don't know if I would have stayed. I really don't, because I wasn't really that interested in doing this stuff. And he gave me an address, and he said, be here on Wednesday night because it's right by where you work, and there's a whole bunch of people there who'd like to meet you. And I'll be looking for you. So I, my phone number's on here. Call me if you get there and you can't find it. But that's the address. So I went to the university synagogue that night and wound up in the middle of the Pacific group. And, uh, you know, it was a, a nice, warm meeting. Everybody was friendly. And some guy kind of adopted me, uh, a guy named Butch. And he brought me to a meeting on Thursday night. And um, I've just been coming back ever since. You know, each night somebody would come get me and take me. And I didn't realize until much later, you know, I, I didn't, I've often, or at least early on, I wondered, why would I stay? Because I feel like, you know, everybody here is really nice and friendly. And why, but why do you stay? I mean, I just stay here for so long. And the point that I, the, 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 the answer I got to that was um, when I was in that meeting the first time in Tustin, and then I came back the next week, and I came back the third week. And I realized that each time I came back to that meeting, there were probably 300 people in that meeting. And every time I sat down in there, I felt safe. I felt like nothing bad was going to happen to me in here, no matter what trouble I'd been in. It wasn't going to happen to me in here because everybody here seemed to be like golden. With, <laughs> they weren't going to wrap me out. They weren't going to, they, they were just there to be supportive and kind. And, and give me some direction, you know? And I didn't have any direction, so I was taking anything I could get, but I wasn't telling anybody, and I wasn't asking for it either. And, uh, but I felt safe there. And so I came to that Wednesday night meeting, and I felt safe there, too. And I was close to work, so I came back the next week, and I started coming back to that meeting, and I, I got a sponsor, so everybody would shut up about if I have a sponsor. And I mean, enough already to have a sponsor. I just got a sponsor so you'd leave me alone. And I'm telling you, for the new people, uh, you don't have to be sincere to stay sober. It's not a prerequisite. In fact, well, it's more fun if you're insincere because they're fun to watch. But uh, but you don't have to be sincere to stay sober because if that was the fact, nobody here would be sober. Even the Alanons would drink if sincerity was required. You know, they just don't. We're just not required of you. But um, but action is, and I know. Um, I thought all I wanted was for somebody to make it feel better. I just want to change my life. I just want to change my life. 
and I got a sponsor to make people leave me alone. And I got this guy and he sat me down and said, here's what I want you to do. I want you to get to a meeting every night. I want you to get a commitment at the meetings that you're at, which means stack chairs, mop the floor, put away the books, clean the bathroom, clean the ashtrays, clean the mug. We had coffee mugs at the time. Clean the mugs. Do whatever you got to do every week and treat it treat like a job. Just show up there and do it no matter what's happening. And then I want you to go out for coffee with people after the meeting so you get to know who they are. You know, listen, hear, hear how they are outside of the meeting. I want you to uh, call, get phone numbers from the men, and I want you to call a guy, some guy every day that you don't know. Just call him and ask him how he's doing. And if he's any good at all, they'll give you 10 minutes. You know, they'll usually just ask yeah, somebody out there on AA, and they'll, you're occupied for 10 minutes. You're, you're good. And, um, and then I want you to um, call me every day, and I want you to pray to a power that's bigger than you are. And I said, oh, okay, here we go. You know, I'm 31 years old. I know what this means. I know that this power greater than you, what that means. And I just don't believe in that power. I, don't, I believe in that power, but I don't believe it has any relevance in my life. You know, I believe it has, uh, I don't care. It, all that power wants to be with are the people that, that kiss its butt. You know, if God likes God likes people who are like God, He likes the He likes the people who go to the church socials and when they have drinks, they measure them out in a, in a, in a shot glass. Free poor people don't go to heaven. Uh, he He likes the people that keep gloves in their glove box. Those kind of people. Uh, but people like me. God, I'm just not one of God's people. He's way up in the penthouse with his people, and I'm way down here in the dark with whoever. I don't know who it is. And that God is not likely to be uh, calling me up anytime soon to come join him. And an al lady reminded me one time, because I, I thought that until I was about five years sober. But uh, this lady said, did you ever think that that higher power would come all the way down in the basement to get you? Because that's what happens. And it was true. And so I, d- I did exactly what my sponsor told me to do. And it's important that people hear that in AA, that, that there's more to this than just sitting around and memorizing the big book and reading the big book to each other and talking about the big book and what Bill meant by although and and studying all this stuff to feel better about life is not enough. I found I had to do things. AA is not a magic wand that we wave and feel better all the time. It's something that they uh, that we are asked to do. And in doing it, we find something that changes us. It, and if you do it, it will change you. You will not have any mistake about it either. You won't have, you won't go, did I change? You'll know you changed. It happened for me. I was eight months sober. I went to my sponsor. I've been doing all my commitments, calling him every day, calling somebody else every day, going up to everybody in the meeting, shaking hands, telling them my name, getting the men's phone numbers, doing all the stuff I was asked to do, cleaning the toilets, cleaning the cups, cleaning the ashtrays, and nothing. I was eight months sober, and AA was clearly not working. And, uh, and I went up to my sponsor and said, when am I going to have a, relig- a, a spiritual awakening? Because I keep hearing people getting up to the podium, you know, and they always cry. And uh, I just, I just had a spiritual awakening today. And they were weeping, you know. They were, and you and you hear it from the most unlikely people too. I didn't believe. I just kind of listened to them, and I, you know, right. And um, so, when's that going to happen for me? And I asked my sponsor sincerely about that, and he looked at me right in the eye and said, "How do I know? Do I look like a psychic? I don't know when you're going to have a spiritual awakening. Just keep doing what you're doing." And it'll happen. And when it happens, you'll know it. You won't wonder. You'll just know when it happens. And I said, oh, yeah, you know, I'm just, I'm still way too smart for these people. You know, this is not, where's the, it almost sounds like there's going to be a magic wand someone's going to whip out in a meeting and start healing people. But um, I did what he said. I kept doing what I was doing. And about two weeks later, it was a Sunday night. A lot of things happened on Sunday nights for me. I don't know. And I was mopping the floor at a, a clubhouse in, in West L.A. called Ohio Street. And we pushed all the pew. We had church pews in there. So we pushed them out of the way. And so the guys would sweep, and we'd mop right behind them. It was, a, it was really it was a clockwork system, believe me. And um, 
I was standing there with my mop while they were pushing the pews back, and I was looking at the people standing in line to thank the speaker, and it occurred to me in here that I knew every one of those people by name, and I liked them. And it took me by surprise. I, I, I never felt so profoundly moved as I did at that moment that I really liked these people, and I hardly knew them. I knew them for eight months, and I thought, if I could be anywhere else on earth right now, apart from holding this mop in this room with these people, I wouldn't go. Even if you offered it to me, I wouldn't go. I want to feel just like I feel right now. And so I went home from there. It only lasted about a 30 seconds, but that's enough for me. And I went back to home, and I called my sponsor that night, and I told him what happened. And he said, you had a moment of grace. That's what a moment of grace feels like. And I said, well, I know what grace is as a Catholic. What does it mean to you? And he said, it's, it's a moment where you get out of your own way enough to let your higher power get out to play. You know, where that higher power, I, I'd had it locked away inside of myself my whole life. I was not going to let that thing out. And then by having all these commitments and doing all this stuff that seemed irrelevant. I mean, when you ask somebody, you know, I could ask Gus, what, how, do, how do I start feeling better? I just feel I'm dis in despair. And he goes, well, we need help mop on the floor tonight. You don't understand the depth of my problem. Obviously, mopping the floor will then do something else. I don't care. All right, I'll mop the floor. And you mop the floor, and then later on you realize, I don't even remember what the problem was when I came in. It's that kind of stuff of getting out of my own way and trusting. And at that point, if I were to do that, because I've known Gus for four, almost 40 years, what happened was I turned my will and my life over to him. And the very fact that I asked him is where the higher power appears. It's not woo, floating in from somewhere. It, it arises in both of us. And if I learn to call people on the phone, even when I'm not in trouble, I call him up. This is Charlie. I met you at the meeting last night, and uh, uh, I'll, well, I hope I see you at the meeting tonight. I hope you're having a good day. Click. Uh, well, I've done that every day for eight months, and then all of a sudden one day I feel terrible and I want to drink, and people say, call somebody. It's not hard to pick up the phone when you've been calling them to tell them you're doing okay and you want to say hi. Then you can pick up the phone and go, help, I'm going to drink. <laughs> Please talk to me. And they'll talk to you. And, and nothing they would ever talk to me about had a thing to do with drinking, and it had nothing to do with them saying the right thing to keep me from drinking. You know what kept me from drinking? Picking up the telephone. That's a surrender. That's surrendering to a power greater than I am. And you'd be surprised how many people, and I just sponsored a guy a while ago, who drank. And I said, did you call anybody? And he said, well, no. I said, you carry that insipid piece of plastic in your hand. 24-7, and when you're about to kill yourself, you didn't think to use it as a telephone, maybe, and call somebody? No. You know, that, that's, but that's alcoholism. We think we know better. We think we can handle, I can handle this. And I, I've learned I can't just handle this. I have to surrender everything. This is a whole package here. My, uh, my friend Johnny, Johnny from down at the uh, Belfar Big Book Group gave a talk about 10 years ago at the Palm Desert Roundup called The Whole Package. I don't know if it's on tape anywhere. I would love to get a copy of it on tape, on CD, anywhere, or streaming, anywhere. And, and it was one of the best talks about what it means to be a member of Alcoholics Anonymous because you got to do the whole package for anything to work. You can't do a quarter of it or parts of it or or do it like a buffet wine and just pick this, but don't take that. you got to just do it. And I, I learned, I'm saying you, I'm talking about me. I've just got to do it, and I hate it. And especially at 40 years, i got to call my sponsor up and go, you know, uh, I had an amends to make 40 years ago, and I didn't make it. What do I do? And he goes, uh, it, was a, it was a monetary amends. And Bob goes, well... Find out who to send. You know who to send it to. And I said, "Well, I know who's there now." He said, "Send him a check and tell him that, that you're you're a sober member of Alcoholics Anonymous and you're paying for uh, uh, 
and amends you at something that you had stolen years ago and never paid back and put some extra in it, but just send off a check. I said, well, I was thinking of contributing to a, to a scholarship program, you know. I think it would be more useful there. Long pause. Bob goes, just send him the check. That's all, that's all you have to do, just something simple. Make your amends with a little note and send him the check. And you know what I did? I went home and I wrote him a check and sent the check. Never had a problem with it inside of me after that. Never ground on it or thought about it or worried about it or thought, i got to do this, but I don't need to do this and try to rationalize my way out of it. I just sent him the money. And it was a good chunk of money. But you know what? It was worth every penny of it to get that feeling away. Because I drink over stuff like that. I drink over stuff like that. And so... uh, I've been in three marriages in my life, uh, two of them sober. I got a divorce in the uh, beginning of the pandemic, which is a good time to get a divorce. I highly recommend it. If you're going to dump your spouse, do it during a pandemic. Uh, uh, it's, it's great practice for your anxiety and your uh, serenity. But uh, I wound up having to sell my house. I lived there for 20 years. My kids wound up, you know, they just turned 20 and 21. They wound up having to find apartments to live in. I moved up to Camarillo by my sponsor. I just felt safe up there. I want to get closer to where my sponsor is. I'll feel better if I'm up near him. And um, and I see him twice a week, and I talk to him on the phone three times a week, and and um, my life is, is good today. You know, after a couple of years of not being involved, I got involved with someone, and, and it's lovely, and we're not married. She's a good member of Alcoholics Anonymous, and and um, my life is good. It's just I just live at home by myself with my old dog, and that old that old dog, you know, sits there giving me a side eye, trying to see which one of us is going to go first. But um, my life is fine. It's fine. You know why? Especially now because I get to come to a live meeting and be with the alcoholics that have walked with me through this. And for those of you who are new. This is just a sampling of what AA, the the benefits of AA, is you're around people who care about you, you're around people who want you to stay and will check in with you, and you're around people people who want to show you what they found in here that helps them, them to live so they don't have to drink. It helps them to find a life with alcoholism rather than uh, a way to stop drinking. This isn't about stopping drinking. This is a this program to me is a way to uh, to treat my alcoholism without using alcohol. And it takes longer. And it takes more patience, but it's real and it's useful, and it makes things worthwhile for me anyway. So. I run, I run on and on, but thank you for having me. I hope you have a great week. Good to see you in the flesh and be in the room with you. And Bob, happy birthday. Thanks for listening. I hope you enjoyed the podcast. Sobercast is ad-free, and we'd like your help in order to keep it that way. So if you'd like to help us be self-supporting by pledging a dollar to a month, visit Sobercast.com and look for the donate links. Thank you very much.